Hello friends, my greetings to everyone. I am Seema and I welcome you all on this segment of Discuss Agile webinar series. Discuss Agile Network is an initiative to connect Agile practitioners so that they can share experiences and take their knowledge and skills to the next level. Topic of today's session is Developer 2.0. We define the role of developer to achieve success for all. And this session will be presented by Mr. Vivek, who is Scrum Master at Game Site. During the session, I request you to type your questions in question box and Vivek will reply at the end of session. Over to you, Vivek. Thank you, Seema. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, this is Vivek. and. Uh... I work with an awesome team in an awesome organization. So I, I work for an organization called Gainsight, uh, which is a big data startup. And uh, as with every startup, uh, there are a lot of learning opportunities that uh, was available to me. And uh, this session is one of those, uh, a result of one of those learning opportunities that I had uh, when I'm working with my current organization. So. Uh, when, when I say developer 2.0, this, this session, whatever session is going to be, this is about developer 2.0, uh, which means that there is a notion of developer 1.0, which is a traditional developer, which has the, the term developer as of today has its own definitions. Basically, there are multiple definitions of developer, right? So generally, how, how do you define developer? Developer, to some people, is a person who develops a solution and uh, to some people developer uh, to people who are you know very much into who are uh, familiar with the scrum terminologies developer is any person who is participating in development of a software it can be a coder it can be an architect it can be a uh, QA engineer so anybody can be a developer so apart from all these definitions what uh, I have observed in the past uh, some months or some or a year, if you say so, that if we slightly redefine the role of a developer, the definition of the word developer, then there is a lot that you can do to the personal growth of the developer or rather professional growth of the developer and the growth of the organization in a broader term. So this session is all about how you can actually do uh, variations on top of what I'm going to tell you now. This is a small, small frame that uh, somebody can adopt under some circumstances which can actually lead to a different results and better results in team play and when you are building a product team. Right? So uh, before I start even, before I start this session, before I start this entire you know, session, uh, I would like to take you through a traditional software development team. So when I say traditional, uh, I'm not talking about waterfall, but even after Agile came into picture, generally how the software development teams are organized is typically they have two roles, right? There are two roles in a software development team uh, where one role is a coder and the other person is a QA engineer or there may be more than one coders and more than one QA engineers. So as a product owner or as organization or as even a customer, if I want to give a user story which a coder and QA engineer can understand well, till now for many organizations, particularly for startups, it is a, still an unachieved goal. Basically it is very difficult or it becomes you know, difficult to get a coder to a mindset of the user. Rather, and, and QA engineer is diff, not so difficult in that aspect, but still to get the coder into a mindset of a user is something very difficult. The nerdy, techy kind of guys. I am a coder myself, so I understand how many things that I have to learn in order to get into the mindset of a user. And uh, when there are multiple people, uh, then it becomes difficult and uh, the product owner is basically confused as to how he can build that mindset of user customer oriented or user oriented uh, thought process. Because if a person is coding a method or if you, if you tell a technical problem to a coder, he thinks of it technically, he can build classes, he can build methods. 
but it is not very easy to inculcate the point where the coder thinks, okay, if I write this method this way, uh, the user is going to have this kind of impact. So it, it's not very easy to get that impact. That is what I learned so far. So how, uh, because of this, uh, the product owner is basically frustrated about the point that, okay, I have to go and tell a lot of things and the coder thinks that, okay, he is intellectually superior and he actually does a lot of techie stuff and uh, somehow he is not able to get the view of the user who is using the application. So this is a one, one phenomenon, but at the same time, is coder the same? For any software development product, uh, the teams generally have multiple roles. Uh, even if you go into the coder role or even uh, anybody who develops the solution, uh, you see that there are multiple roles. There will be uh, tech stack based separations. So there can be, there will be a front end coder in many organizations. And uh, there can be an architect who will, uh, you know, uh, make it a very big, uh, make a, you know, strategic design for the organization. And there are some other people. So coder is actually not a single person as shown in this figure, but it actually looks like this, right? So there are multiple people who are coding together. So at the point of, at the point where multiple people are coding, uh, and uh, Scrum Master is a person who has to, you know, make the team self-organized. And Scrum Master also gets confused because now a story belongs to four or five different people. Uh, and four or five different people, the Scrum Master is uh, responsible for creating a necessary communication channel or a work process where all these coders and a QA engineer collaborates with everybody so that a proper uh, story is developed, so that a proper result is achieved. So uh, what what is the problem in this is because first of all the, the, the mindset that the coder has to leave his technical learning, not leave actually, he has to see both ways. How a user uses his application and how his code will fit to, for that use case and he has to basically understand how a QA engineer will test his code. So there are a lot of aspects. So for the purpose of this session, when I mean developer, I just don't mean the coder, I mean the QA engineer also and I, I in the later part of the session I'll explain uh, wh why you, how you can actually face this out uh, when you redefine the role of developer in an organization. So going forward, so we had a traditional team where there are multiple coders with their own mindsets of how to code, they are technically excellent, they are technically excellent people but in order to get a single point visibility and create a work process as to you know, people sharing all the work and also to get a view of view of the product from the view of a customer. And also, it's not a single QA engineer. I'm oversimplifying the problem by having a single QA engineer in this uh, diagram. There are actually multiple QA engineers on multiple stages of QA. It can be like, uh, there will be a user acceptance testing. There might be integration testing if there is an integration point. There are multiple points at which testing also has to be done. Typically in a startup, if you had already started with the automation framework in place, then things are good. But generally, uh, in the initial mode, at least uh, our startup started with, uh, you know, a little manual testing, and now we are, we are actually stepping up on automation. So in that case, you need uh, some manual engineer, manual testing effort that always goes into some release, which adds to the confusion. So this is a traditional mindset. Now, instead of having these many people and just two roles, coder and QA engineer, let us try to shift the paradigm a little bit and we'll try something different. So instead of calling people as, you know, uh, coder and QA engineer, let us, uh, what we tried was in order to, uh, in order to understand and in order to improve the ownership and in order, in order to inculcate the behavior of user based thinking. When I see a user story, how do I see it from the point of view of user? How do I get into a hacker mindset? How do I get into a, a reviewer mindset? In order to achieve all these, uh, inculcate all these mindsets, change all the mindsets of all the people involved in the team, what we did was we tried uh, creating three different definitions for a developer. So a developer at one point can be a coder or he can be a devil's advocate. I'll explain these rules uh, in a little while or that person can be a reviewer. So, uh, Understand here that the QA engineer does not come into picture here, right? And when I say coder, it is not just coder. A person who is architecting the solution, he can also fall under the purview of coder. 
right? So a developer can play any of these roles at one certain point of time. So for one story, uh, if a person is coder, that person will take responsibility for how to develop the system. For example, how to satisfy the acceptance criteria, whatever the PO has decided, how to satisfy, he develops code uh, and he develops the necessary infrastructure or architecture also in order to satisfy the requirements behind the story, user story. And devil's advocate is a person uh, who is actually adding a lot of fun, flavor and learning to the entire thing. Devil's advocate is a person, his mindset is a single word. He has to break anything that the coder develops by whatever means. So basically the devil's advocate is a person who is having a hacker mindset and this person will try to break anything that the coder develops. Which means that if there are any, 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 in any aspect, if it is either in the security aspect or it can be either in the user story itself, he can even go and uh, add one test case to the point where, you know, uh, the PO comes back and says, oh, I didn't even think of this case. So devil's advocate is a person who is authorized to do anything in order to break whatever the coder can do. And then he gives feedback to developer, so to coder, and the coder basically improves his code so that his code is actually immune to the immune to whatever broke it. And reviewer is a person who reviews the code and test cases and every, anything that a developer develops. And so if you, if you take a look at devil's advocate and reviewer, they are of two opposite sides of the same word. Devil's advocate also reviews the reviews the work. Reviewer also reviews the work. But reviewer reviews it from the point of is it satisfying my checklist. So he is playing a positive role. But devil's advocate is a person, a black hat role or a negative role, where he is trying to break the things that the coder actually developed. Right? And when I say coder, does he actually just code? No, not really just code. He writes test cases as well, which means that the coder starts writing test cases and then writes code and in between devil's advocate can go review or break his code, break his test cases. Sometimes his test cases are not just enough to satisfy the acceptance criteria, right? So in such case devil's advocate will directly go review the test cases and if necessary he will break the test case and he will basically uh, direct the coder to add one more test case. These are the possible scenarios. Whereas if you just have two people, only once one there is information flows only in one or two you know iterations. But here, if you see, devil's advocate is constantly trying to break the workflow, whatever the coder has built, right? So now we have three people: coder, devil's advocate, and reviewer. Now previously, what we had, we had coder and QA engineer, right? We will shortly uh, get into the point who fits where, but the general approach that we took was. For the phase one, let the QA engineer uh, part be separate. Now let us unify the coder. There is a backend coder, there is a UI coder, there is a UX, UX developer. There are a lot of variations inside the coder. So what we tried in the phase one was unify all the coder definitions into a single developer 2.0 definition. So any developer will do any of these three tasks. Now when people do these three, these play these three roles. How long do they play or what is the scope of their role? Is the role, uh, you know, for a single story? Yes. So one person, for example, if you see it, if you see, see this slide, uh, the coder is represented with uh, one icon, devil's advocate with a black hat and reviewer with a magnifying glass. So if a developer one plays the role of coder in story one inside a particular sprint or a release and the same developer can play the role of devil's advocate in a different story. Which means that in a single sprint, a person gets to do multiple jobs parallel. Right? So for story one, he will code and story two, he will try to break whatever the other developer did. And for story three, he will basically review all the test cases and review anything that he basically conforms, conforms uh, the, checks the conformity to the acceptance criteria given by the so a single person who is a developer can basically play the uh, three different roles in multiple stories. In story one, this person will be a uh, coder, story two, a, uh, a devil's advocate, and story three, a reviewer. Right? So this way, multiple people can do multiple 
and since there is a flavor in the daily job that you are doing your job is not as boring as it was before and basically what happens when this thing happens is that the person who plays the devil's advocate since his entire job is to break the story or break whatever the solution the coder has developed he gets naturally good at understanding the user's point of view of the story right which means that in every story there is at least one person who understands end to end of how this story is fitting into the bigger picture of your product right and uh, when this devil's advocate finds a fault and he goes back to the developer or the coder what he will say he will say that you know what i was trying to do this thing this is how it fits in the bigger vision of the product and your code does not just do that now this information of what is the bigger pitch how this story fits into the bigger picture of product gets gets uh, transferred from the devil's advocate to the coder as well right so there are over a period of time you see that people generally get better at understanding the bigger picture and they come out of their smaller picture mindset so we have seen coders uh, thinking only about uh, you know their methods their classes and from there they have started thinking about how this user story is not fitting well with the user story that some other team is developing that is something that we have seen uh, in our organization and uh, there are some developers who go to po and ask uh, you know what you are trying to do this thing but are you sure users will like this doesn't isn't this the no normal way in which uh, users use our application this somehow contradicts with that behavior and there are many instances where product owner was feeling happy because people are giving constructive feedback right at the end of the day product owner also needs some validation about whether uh, you know he is thinking in the right direction or not and this framework provides a feedback to product owner as well because the devil's advocate does try to break the user story as well so the product owner gets feedback from the devil's advocate as well that way this entire redefinition of the a single coder or a ui developer i write only html code from that mindset a person comes out his 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 sphere of influence expands and that person starts feeling okay this is the story that i am coding for and this makes this impact by writing this story by coding for this story i am helping the user save these much hours of time so this much change in mindset you get so what is the side product side pro, side product or you know uh, unintended consequence of this kind of of your vision is that people own up things because they see meaning in it when a developer just thinks that he writes classes and methods there is very less likely that the person will own things up when there is a customer escalation uh, a team lead or a scrum master or a manager has to be on top of his head to fix things but uh, or or th there must be some other motivation for him to fix things but when a developer or a devil certificate or a reviewer actually develops a story in this mindset his ownership of the work that he does increases and as a result what happens is that that person takes things on his own rather the, the, if there is a customer escalation the person feels actually obliged to to, to you know work on the particular aspect and uh, he feels proud about you know uh, developing the solution so as he can uh, so that he can help a, a person who is sitting in the different corner of the world which is a customer so this is how we basically help transitioning the mindset of the developer or a coder whatever you call it right now to a person who owns things up to a person who understands how the product is used by the customer and to the point where he develops his own center of excellence now this person goes and talks to other people he gives feedback to product owner to the point where he the product owner has to go check whether that is actually the case and come back and say hey you know what you are right i was wrong in saying that is a proper use case the person starts giving uh, you know ideas for betterment of the product now product owner is not the single person who owns the product but the collective team owns the product and that is what this particular model will lead us to that has led us uh, one one team in uh, again side tried this and that is what it has led to there is no ownership issue there is no 
you know point where you know the product owner gets a lot of constructive feedback from the team members that is where it led to and uh, coming to the workflow so when i say three people working on the same story there might be a lot of confusion as to what the typical workflow is this is the typical workflow that we follow first test case authoring by the coder right the coder who wants to code for the story or a person who wants to code for the story writes all the test cases that he wants to so that he can satisfy the acceptance criteria and then the devil's advocate and reviewer both review their test cases independently the code reviewer the, or the reviewer basically reviews the test cases and checks whether it conforms to the um, acceptance criteria given by the product owner and the devil's advocates try to break his test cases you know what just these test cases are not enough or this test case if done this test case actually does not test the product it does this goes against so he basically does a different view of the test cases try, by trying to break the test cases or by trying to prove the coder wrong in a constructive way that way the test cases are taken care of now the test design and test authoring ends at this point then the coder actually sits and develops the solution so he basically passes all his test cases now since test cases have already gone through a review requirements are very clear even at this point even before this point when the test case review happens the devil's advocate goes back to the product and uh, tells his views about uh, how how many uh, more acceptance criteria need to be added if it has to fit to the bigger picture so this is something that will happen and then solution development happens where the coder tries to pass all the test cases right and when the coder tries to pass all the test cases it is in its development environment which is as good as you know a local environment but there might be 100 different scenarios or different environments where things can fail so what happens is that after the solution development again these two people sit independently not together the devil said the gate and the code reviewer or the reviewer reviews the solution that this guy provided so the reviewer typically looks at the code looks for design patterns looks for any you know maintainability code maintainability issues and all things and the devil said the case just sits and tries to break the code so basically he sits on a test environment and tries to break the code whereas and the, the devil said the case also naturally executes all the test cases so that he can be sure that in case of manual testing required this guy also executes all the test cases now what has happened is that this story has matured and this story can be given to user acceptance testing very uh, directly from this phase where you know things are rock solid because it has gone through a negative testing aspect that there is a person who always finds fault and if that person says yes so who will give a sign off to a story the person who gives sign off to a story is devil's advocate no one else will give sign off to the story and uh, during the initial sprint planning we identify the devil's advocate and devil's advocate owns the entire execution of the story so it is not just from the story standpoint but also from the process standpoint the devil's advocate owns the story coder does not own the story reviewer does not own the story but devil's advocate owns the story which means that the devil's advocate has to continuously follow up with the coder and the reviewer to get to a point where the story is ready to ship and that way we can make sure that there are the even when there are process loop holes we add an additional you know feedback loop where the devil's advocate speaks to scrum master or the necessary stakeholder to a point where when there is a process that has to be changed when he broke a process see i was able to go ahead go to uat without doing all these things i was able to find out if he is able to break a process he will give a feedback to the scrum master or the person who is basically designing the work process so the devil's advocate is is a very nice and a very you know interesting role to play and uh, many people are naturally suited for this role <laughs> at the end of the day we are very good in finding faults rather than you know giving solutions so let us take advantage of that you know quality and uh, make it a constructive that way you can basically bring additional you know value to the organization and when all this happens you get a feedback loop to the uh, to the product owner so basically it results in a happy product owner and happy product owner basically talks to everybody in between when the work is happening so when the coder has a problem or when the coder has a question the product owner responds thereby establishing a communication 
and the, when, whenever there is a problem, whenever there is a question during the devil's advocate, devil's advocate found a way to break the use case which does not fit into the bigger product roadmap, bigger product vision, then the devil's advocate talks to product owner. Then the product owner's vision improves and the product owner gets a feedback as to how, it, how he can improve things. So that is one thing, that is why he is happy. Again, during development also he answers questions. Even in solution review he answers the questions and he is able to get feedback as well. So basically the, our product owner is very happy that he is able to get a feedback also in addition to making sure that people are communicating. So the communication happens in all the phases with the product owner, right? Not just during the sprint plan. And at the same time, the customer is also happy because there is a meaningful software that comes out of this team. So when the product owner is happy or putting it vice versa, product owner will be happy only when the customer is happy. So the fact that product owner is happy, yeah, we have left, it has led to many happy customers. Uh, the, the, the team which worked on this framework has received many customer appreciations so, uh, till date. So the customer appreciations and uh, you know there we have a uh, different teams, uh, we have a uh, services and customer support team uh, sitting in the different part of the world. Uh, still uh, we are able to work with them whenever any product escalations happens, any, any urgent issues happen, any firefighting people work with them, there is an increased sense of ownership that uh, there, are, there are a lot of uh, kudos given to the team just for the ownership part till day. And so basically happy customer happens. And then very importantly, when I say success for all, if you see the title of this session, developer 2.0, redefine the role of developer to achieve success for all. All includes the product owner, happy customer and also the people who are developing the solution, right? The people who develop the solution are happy because they are able to make a meaningful contribution, their vision is better now and uh, their, their work is getting more, you know, popular and uh, their work is better and they, they get a sense of satisfaction that they are making a meaningful contribution to lives of some other people. So they are also happy and their skill sets gradually increase. Right, so they are also happy. Now, what this has led is a success for all scenario where product owner is happy, and uh, you know the team, total team members are happy, and customers are also happy. So this leads to a scenario where everybody is happy about what is being done. Now, uh, when this happens, why is this good for coders? When 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 I say coder in a traditional architect in a traditional team formation, coder is a person you know who develops UI or a person who develops the backend code or any person who involves in coding. Why is this good for coders? Uh, any uh, is is uh, Seema our audience uh, allowed to talk or can they talk? Not right now. Session? Not right now. Okay, uh, okay fine. Later. So yeah. why is it you know, why is it uh, good for coders? Uh, this is good for coders because of a variety of reasons. First, any coder who is starts as a UI developer becomes acquainted to the backend knowledge also and vice versa. Right? We will talk about that later and coders typically get a sense of what is the direct, comp direct contribution that they do for the, uh, to the organization and there are lesser bugs that get found. There are lesser bugs that uh, you know, downstream team, user acceptance team, or uh, you know, the customers find in their code. So it's better for the coders that this new redefinition is, you know, affecting them positively. And why is this good for QA engineers? QA engineers, it is good because I, I told you already, there are two phases uh, that we are trying out. We, are, we, uh, we haven't even started the second phase. So keeping in the first phase is that we will unify all the coders into developer 2.0 definition and then include the QA, QA engineers if possible and if found, you know, feasible into the developer 2.0 notion. So currently in our organization, the coders in, in our team, coders are under, all coders are under developer 2.0, you know, definition. So QA engineers are basically good because they feel good because the code that they get for testing is already sort of tested and, you know, tough, um, proved for its goodness, like it, it is already tested by someone else before. And the second thing is that while this is happening, QA engineers, typically in our case, there was a lot of, you know, automation test cases that had to be written because we, initial times we did not have a lot 
lot of automated test cases and the QA engineers had got a lot of time because if they are not doing manual testing they can invest the time which is more meaningful for a QA engineer. So it was good for QA engineers because they got some time to write automated test cases well, while uh, the developer 2.0, the, the people who were under definition of developer 2.0 took care of a lot of you know um, bug fighting tasks if you would say so. And it is, co it is good for coders and it is good for QA engineers and uh, at the end why is this good for organization? Organization uh, it is good just because of the fact that it increases the sense of ownership in each person who is inside a team and uh, this person uh, it increases it, it increases the visibility uh, of what the user wants it increases the visibility of uh, what the user wants in um, and it seems to all the people who are working directly on the uh, on the uh, user stories so that is why it is good for the organization and uh, why uh, that there is one more aspect to it like when there is a sen increased sense of team ownership people will you know uh, spend more time and they will do, uh, they will put in extra diligence there is uh, there is one more fact that the customers will find lesser bugs when this framework comes into picture because there is uh, there is a devil's advocate who is you know our in-house uh, mad user if you will say so so in-house mad user is there and that mad user will try to break things and uh, people will already fix which the user is user can break which means that there will be a lesser number of bugs and your products quality in front of customers will be uh, better than uh, the current the traditional approach so that is why it is good for organizations as well right now uh, coming to the point where you know all this is done how is this even possible if you want to unify it in your organization uh, the, we, we did it for a phase one like I told where all the coders UI coders backend coders and we have a salesforce.com component which is a separate language altogether so salesforce.com developer is a separate uh, you know uh, skill set or separate set of developers in our organization for all practical purposes. But uh, the team that I work with basically unified every developer. There is a Java developer, there is a HTML, CSS and the JavaScript developer which is a UI developer and there is a Salesforce.com developer. All these three developers were merged into a single you know definition of developer 2.0 which means that if you are a coder for a story you should be able to handle the tasks end to end, right? So if I am if I am basically a SFTC Salesforce.com developer and I am the coder for a story, will I alone be able to will I uh, do the task if I'm not trained in all the other aspects as well? So what we did was, in order to make this possible, the prerequisite was cross training of people, cross training of tech, cross training of people in technologies. So any salesforce.com developer was slowly, uh, you know, they need not be experts in UI, but they were acquainted to the concept of how to write good UI code, right? Uh, so which means that uh, any person can write uh, Java code as well, salesforce.com Apex code as well, and uh, the UI code as well. So this cross training was an initial step which was necessary to get to the point where all coders are, you know, under the same umbrella of developer and once this was possible, any person can review the code of any other person, any person can play the devil in advocate, any person can write code for any story. Previously, the product owner had to think twice or the scrum master had to, you know, understand the resource allocations. I, it's a very bad word to call as resource. But, uh, you know, uh, the, if you want to allocate people for a story, you, the, the, the allocation or the team itself is very confused as to, okay, this person is a Salesforce developer, this person is a Java developer, this person is a UA developer and this is the story and uh, there are a lot of communications and handoffs required. If multiple people are working on a story, handoffs increase and when handoffs increase, it's a, it's a very nice recipe for, you know, miscommunication. So better if a single person, if you are under, in addition to this, in addition to cross training, one more aspect, the other pillar which made this possible was thinly sliced stories. So if a story is very big, then a single developer will not be able to work on it 
as a coder. But if uh, a story is appropriately sliced, if, if it is, uh, uh, you know, very uh, thinly sliced, then it is possible that a single person can able to take it up, a single person can able to do devil's advocate task, and a single person can do code review. Work. And the same person cannot do two tasks, understand this question. So a same person cannot do two tasks. So there are two pillars which made this possible. One is cross training of people in multiple technologies that are needed to develop our software. In your organization, it may be a different, different kind of skill sets, right? And uh, the second pillar that enabled us to get this to this point is where we are able to thinly slice the story. The stories are so thin to the point that uh, the work, uh, all the three points are done within like one or two days. All the three works, the coding, development, the coding, the devil's advocate that and uh, the review, all three are done simultaneously within two, maximum of three days, not more than that. So if you are able to get to that point, uh, it needs some input student product, but once we are able to get to that point, this started really faster. This this was possible for us to, you know, get there. And uh, some learnings from the implementation. So as I told you, we were trying to phase it out. Phase one was integrate all the developers or coders into a single unified definition of developer 2.0. Phase two is it to start in our organization, and depending on feasibility, we might start for we, we might try it with a team, right? Where QA is also the QA engineers are also imbibed into the same notion of developer code of zero, right? So talking about what we learned from our implementation in the first phase, where all the coders were imbibed into the same definition of developer code of zero, one key learning was that every person is happy to learn new things. Right. So there has never been an instant when I went and talked to a UI developer uh, or a new hire in our company, new hire in the team, into the team specifically, and ask, hey, I know that you are an expert in UI, but uh, you know, do you mind learning something in uh, Java as well? That person invariably says yes. Right. So it is in our mind. I, I, I'm not against having experts here. We need experts. Expert advisors are needed whenever you know you want to develop new things and whenever you want to develop uh, nice products, expert advisors are needed. We are not going away from the concept of experts here. But at the same time, when multiple people, when a person can actually uh, you know, be a novice uh, coder or even an intermediate level coder in multiple technologies, that adds, your team, adds to the team's velocity a lot. So now, uh, the people do not say that, you know, I don't want to know Java. If I, I, I know I am from UI, but I can learn Java so that, you know, because they get uh, inspired by other people. There are people who, uh, who started as Salesforce.com developers, and they are now full stack developers. We use the term full stack developers, where they can go across the stack. They are not experts. They are experts in only one of their fields but they are able to easily maneuver. They have the understanding so that they can make meaningful contributions in any part of the tech stack. And that is something which is which is adding to the phenomenal personal growth, the pro professional growth of uh, each developer who took part in this team or uh, took part in this initiative. And also as an organization, now the organization need not think or the product owner need not think, okay, this team, the work that I'm going to give is, you know, UI heavy, uh, but I have only one UI developer in the team, will the team be able to deliver? What if there are only UI reorganizations for one entire release, for one, in, for one sprint? Will the other people sit, sit out anywhere? Not really. Everybody is able to contribute. So that is one key learning. Nobody says no to learn things. It is just within our mind that we do not want them. Like we, we think that, you know, people are experts. Yeah, let them be expert, but let them be at least an intermediate developer in other technologies. That is one key learning that we learned. And the second key learning that we learned is that uh, the velocity goes down the very initial period. So whenever a developer starts, basically that person has to learn. And then that person has to basically perform. So initial sprint or initial 15, 20 days, uh, that person spends a lot of time in learning. So if you 
uh, compare the velocity of a traditional model with this, the velocity will decrease, but slowly, slowly it starts picking up to a point where you know you you don't even know because how does the velocity increase? Because a single person handles handles the story and the story is thinly sliced, which means that the communication points are reduced, handoffs are reduced, so communication gaps are reduced, and if a single person has a full context of what he is doing, it makes him do his job better rather than waiting for other people. Generally, what happens? A UI is written by one a UI developer, and he waits for the backend API to be done, right? Or a backend API is done, and it, it, the backend story, the story waits for the UI developer to be available so that the UI can be built up. So these kind of classical waiting scenarios are reduced when a single person is able to maneuver across the text stack. That is another point. And the third learning that we had was that uh, the people who never came out and told that you know they will contribute to something, they will you know work on some uh, big issue that came that came from the support. The people who were little hesitant to show their contributions, who were you know little uh, closed, started becoming open because this involves a lot of collaboration with your other developers. Leave uh, leave the communication between developer and QA. Communication between developer and developer is little difficult when they are from different tech stacks. Typically when UI person and the backend person agree on a data contract and that data contract is breached, you have seen people fighting for it like anything. But after we come to this phenomenon, people are actually having, because everybody helps other people. Every developer, every developer helps another developer by either reviewing his code or by doing it uh, devils and the task. Which means that every developer contributes to the growth of other developers. So the mutual respect for developers increases, and that increase that that helps in a better you know understanding between the team. So when one person takes off, the other two people invariably manage things. Even in case of emergencies, we are able to manage better the good relationship that lasts between the people who are in there. Otherwise, if if they are divided by technologies, they are divided by the tech stacks. It's it's like religion. Okay, they fight that. Okay. Java is best, and other person will say the UI JavaScript is best. And uh, we are seeing less of those kind of debates and discussions with this, because everybody respects each other because everybody is on the same page. So three key learnings are that one is nobody wants to say no to learning new things, and uh, the kind of uh, the the ownership or the you know the person who are uh, uh, not very forthcoming. They 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 come come to the forefront. They take uh, uh, in they take your uh, they take initiatives to make the product better. They suddenly go and talk to the product owner. The person who has never talked to product owner before just goes and talks to product owner and says, Hey, you know what? I think this rather than doing this way, if I do it this way, the product uh, it will fit our product more, right? People start feeling pride about it. And then the third point is that uh, people. Uh, fight less because they respect each other and everybody contributes to each other's growth and uh, also the velocity goes low initially and then it comes up to a point where you know it is better than traditional velocity. Uh, we are still collecting data points so probably uh, what I am thinking is I am planning to write a, a white paper or something that with the data points that we collect so that other people can improvise this back. So uh, one question that always lingers at the end of all these things is: Is this a is this the uh, you know the most perfect work process? Certainly not. But this is better than what we had already different. And should, will this suit your organization? I honestly don't know. You have to you know uh, understand. You have to do a trial to make sure to basically know whether this will suit your organization or not. Because you know your organization better than how I know my or how I know your organization, right? And uh, the fact always remains that the more we question the status quo, the more we question the current status, uh, we learn a lot and we improve it. And that is what matters at the end of the day. Are am I better than what I was yesterday? That is what is important in life. And uh, by constantly challenging the status quo and learning from others and promoting a culture of mutual respect, we always get to learn from other people and also get to learn from ourselves at the end of the day. So 
this is where I stop and I would like to take any questions if there is. Yeah. Do we have any questions? Yes, Vivek, we have received good number of questions and, uh, and I am assigning one by one. Okay, I have assigned first question. Okay. Yeah, as per this framework, uh, all the members should have work in all of the area. Every team member should have programming knowledge. Uh, and the question was asked by Mahesh. Uh, yes, Mahesh. Uh, actually, yes. All the team members, it is advised, advisable that all team members work in all areas. And everybody, it, it's advisable that everybody should have programming knowledge. And when I say programming knowledge, it's not just programming knowledge. Everybody should have a knowledge about if I am talking about a general concept of you know bringing both coders and QA engineers into the same definition of developer 2.0, even coders who are already good in programming already should know how to excel at some QA technologies. For example, a coder might uh, not know how to use JMeter, which is typically a testing tool, but a coder should be able to learn how to use JMeter for automation for uh, you know making API testing faster. So it's not just QA people learning programming, it is also vice versa. A coder should also be able to learn how a QA works. At the end of the day, if everybody knows what the other person is doing, right? Point number one, you get to a point where uh, anybody can do a job. Of course, we are not moving away from experts here as I told earlier. But we are coming to a point where uh, everybody can contribute positively to the environment. And everybody will respect other people's opinions because they, they also do the same job at the end of the day. Does that answer your question? I hope it, it answers that question. Yeah, I have assigned another question. Uh, okay. Does developer author a story, estimate story, and groom backlog? Uh, authoring a story, if you're talking about the technicality of who actually keys in the details of the story into maybe Jira or Trello or anything. Um, it can be anybody uh, and there is nothing stopping a developer from authoring a story but generally the story's input comes from a product owner, right? But yes, estimation of the story comes from developer and when you say estimation, it comes from uh, basic, one second, let me, yeah, now I am able to see the questions better. So when you, when you uh, say estimation, the estimation contains three aspects, the estimation for coding, estimation for devil's advocate task and the estimation for the review task. So that is how a developer 2.0 participates is an estimation. And yes, developer groups backlog, that is before even the work starts. So the developer 2.0 certainly participates in group backlog. So author a story, not really, but if he has all the details of the story, there is nothing stopping him from authoring the story. Estimate story, yes. And the groom backlog, certainly yes. Right? And uh, there is another question from Krishna. And by the way, last question was uh, uh, take, uh, um, given by Mr. Manish. Thanks, Manish. And I have another question by Mr. Krishna. Uh, Vivek, thanks for the interesting topic. How do you motivate development team members to learn secondary skills? Uh, there is, I, I don't think uh, there is a need for uh, you know separate motivation. I also was in the same mindset initially. Somehow I got you know I got the courage. And I just went and asked, like, if, uh, like the one question that I kept asking was, you know, uh, okay, I know that you are a UI developer, but do you mind learning about Java as well? So if you ask, uh, I have never received a no for an answer till date. Everybody invariably says yes. There was a UI architect who was a part of my team, and uh, he answered, yes, why not? So nobody says no to learning opportunities. And one caveat here is that whenever you say a person wants to learn, at the same time, a person is afraid, should not be made afraid of failure. So general thought which if I am a developer, I am actually a UI coder, I am doing UI coding. And suddenly one person comes and assigns a you know, uh, back-end coding task to me, I, I freak out just because of the fact that I am afraid of the failure and what the failure costs me. Right? If we make our coding environment proper so that you know people can get help whenever needed and there is a low cost of failure. The cost of failure is what is important. So if you have some safety nets, like for example, if it is Java code, if you have enough J units and enough automation test cases, so 
so that any mistake that a person makes will not cost very high both on the developer and for the organization then the people will be okay to try anything that you because the cost of failure is very low but when the cost of failure is very high okay nobody writes jail on this nobody no, there is no automation testing there is no safety net there is no ci just go on write back end code that is a recipe for disaster right so it makes sense that you motivate people just by you know opening that option up for them hey you know what this is a open option do you want to take it that itself serves as a motivation because nobody says no and people will say yes only when they don't see a big failure big fear of failure even if i do something wrong it should not affect the organization at the end of the day so it also is a function of what is the cost of failing if a person does writes bad code how does your person from actually uh, making that bad code go to the customer that is where it ends so if you are able to build safety nets for any coder even for experienced coder i feel better when i am refactoring my methods because i have some jail nets at the top of me which is going to fail when i do something wrong that is when people will the velocity increases a lot during that point so control the cost of failure point number 1 and how to motivate just ask them after controlling the cost of failure people will certainly say yes to you right and there is another question what are the effective methods that you are employing in uh, achieving thinly sliced user stories um what i do is uh, a simple you know measure i'll try to bring it to a point where there is exactly one benefit that the customer gets out of that story not more than one exactly one benefit the user story can be you know uh, add a folder delete a folder rename a folder and then you know add stuff inside the folder but if you slice it thinly there will be exactly one benefit so add a folder is single benefit and assuming that somebody added a folder view folders in a tree is a second benefit right so if you are able to get to a point where you start you know slicing the story where exactly one benefit is what is the benefit that the customer gets or the user gets Ah, huh. that that is what I do, but I don't have. Uh, I I I also would like to know if someone has ideas about how, about how to thinly slice stories. I think there is an art, and we get better only when we practice. And then the second one is how it is different from TDD with assumption that agile expects generalist specialist. So team members are expected to know dev test etc. What is differentiation points of developer to dot show? so okay so it is asking me uh, the the question is basically how is it different from tdd test driven development because agile expects a generally specialist and tdd is tdd when you do tdd using agile methodologies already it is sort of solving the purpose right so what what is it exactly doing uh, so team members are expected to know no dev test what is the differentiating points of developer 2.0 uh, differentiation point of developer 2.0 one that i consider uh you know to be a stark differentiator is the role of a devil advocate devil advocate is a single point which makes the entire development workflow spicy and uh, devil advocate is the person who actually gives feedback to the product owner as to what is good and what is not good he gives feedback to the scrum master in the process as as to how the process works and uh, the devil advocate basically gives feedback to a lot of people so that give a lot of people he tries to break things and there is fun in all, there is always fun in breaking things and making them work so i think developer 2.0 stands out because of the fact that it inculcates a hacker mindset in each person so that they try to break anything that they see and then the second differentiating aspect is that uh, every person will be able to do all the one of these two, three roles simultaneously for story one i am reviewer for for story two i am devil advocate for story three i am a developer so giving this different job roles rather than having a single role of coder or a tester is more meaningful and it gives more direction as to what that person is to do rather than having you know say roles of coder and tester i hope that uh, you know answers that uh, question of uh, what is the differentiating point of developer to option okay and uh, coming to the next question uh by uh, okay mr vivek kumar did you face any challenges in developing team with multiple skill sets 
in general people are very apprehensive about switching to a different skill set how did you motivate to go for multi skill set so one thing to remember is that we are not asking people to switch they are not going to leave their earlier skill set they are going to add to their existing skill set which means that if i am a ui developer i am going to remain a ui expert but in addition to being a ui expert now i get to do java work as well so basically this is not a switching this is like learning something new so that you can add more color to your profession at the end of the day your resume will look good right because you have you know ui you have worked in ui you have worked in java you have worked in multiple technologies right that is what is needed and uh, the sec next question is how are you overcoming challenges related to appraisals without compromising team culture um honestly uh, appraisals are you know something that are out of my hand basically when it is when when there is feedback my job as a scrum uh, you know uh, scrum master and as a person who coaches the team is to make sure that the talent inside every person comes out right so my job is not related to appraisal so i honestly cannot answer the questions about appraisals but at the same time uh, what i see is that people are more happy with their jobs because it obviously shows even if you write things down last year i knew x y z now i know some four more things apart from x y and z when you are able to show that in front of your person who is doing your appraisal certainly you are going to get better things right that is natural so if you directly ask about appraisals i honestly have no idea because i don't control that aspect of people my job is to make sure that people you know get better over a period of time to bring the best out of people that is my job and that is what i enjoy doing but my honest belief is that my my deep belief is that when people get better they are bound to get better ratings in the appraisals or any any process that you know even even for personal satisfaction it is they they get better so i think that is what makes a lot of difference and uh, there is another question by vivek kumar won't they lose focus because of context switching uh context switching is a you know a, a, a very sensitive topic where you know a person there is a, there is there are lot of beliefs that you know context switching is um positive and context switching is negative uh, i don't want to take any of this beliefs uh, we just tried this and we found that people are actually happy because it gives a flavor to their job see for example since morning to afternoon i keep on coding okay and afternoon to evening also if you ask me to code you know my job becomes a very boring job but if i have a real flavor okay okay see for the past two hours i coded and the next two hours i am going to make sure that i am breaking this guy's code that adds a flavor that actually keeps people motivated and basically they are not losing focus but they are actually uh, what realigning the focus to a different task if you do the same job for a lot longer amount of time you will generally lose focus if you listen to this 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 webinar is just one hour if i keep on talking about in this webinar for like four hours you will certainly lose focus because you are doing the same thing again for four hours but if it is one hour webinar some another hour something else another hour something else you basically realign your focus to that task and that is what i have seen happening not people losing focus because of context switching i hope that answers the question so uh, is that all have we reached the end of the questions uh, i have a sign another question uh, yeah okay okay how would you pursue this model in your company that one right yeah okay uh, i okay i am assuming something in this question how would you pursue in this model and your question probably that person is asking if i am going back to my organization i want to pursue this model or i want to become an evangelist for this model how do i tell people that this model is there? Uh, if that is a question uh, what you can do is uh, start understanding the three roles better uh so uh, i think uh, a session is uh, recording or uh, i i can even send the uh, powerpoint presentation that i prepared you can share this ppt with uh, your team members 
and uh, any stakeholders if that is necessary. And always, that is what, if you go today and tomorrow you want to change people's mindset, it's not possible. You have to make people do a different cross training, you have to make people more open, you have to, you know, uh, reach out to people on a personal level to a point where, you know, they feel comfortable about doing this. The cost of failure should be reduced. So once those are done, then things will automatically fall. That is what I strongly believe. Uh, anything else? Yes, I have assigned another question already. Can a developer play different role of developer, devil advocate, reviewer for different students at the same time? Certainly, that is the intention. A single de developer will play the role of a coder in one story, and devil advocate in second story, a reviewer in third story, and devil advocate in fourth story. That is where it becomes, you know, where, uh, adding a lot of color and fun to the you know, the job that you do on it. That is intended. If a person does developer work only for one day, entire sprint, the next sprint you can be sure that the person will start looking for other opportunities in different companies. I can write and give it to you. Anything else? Uh, I think uh, we have done with the questions. Uh, thanks, Vivek. Uh, we have reached the time box. And I would like to thank uh, for all pa participants. Thanks for joining in. Can I also would like to thank them. Yeah, so keep connected with our various web events. Once again, thank you. Thank you.